In many ways, I personally think of the technology problem as solving the Viagra problem. What that means is that in a wealthy society like the US, the amount of R&D that goes into solving the Viagra problem so that men can enjoy a, a happier, more satisfying sexual life, the amount of R&D is so much more than what goes into solving malaria and TB and so many other, other deadly diseases that affect the poor. Let me give two examples of things that are extremely relevant to, to South Asia, Pakistan, and to India. This is the polio vaccine. And as you know, I mean, unfortunately, polio is coming back a little bit in, in Pakistan, but essentially, we've all but eradicated it from the face of the planet because of the vaccine. This one's a little harder to guess. Can you take it? So this is... Um, it, these are pictures of um, a new variety of seed that came out of the Green Revolution. So what was happening in those days, in the, back in the 60s, was that rice, the stalk was very long. Right? And in wind and in rains, the stalk would, would be blown over. And uh, vast amounts of rice would get destroyed. And that was causing just a massive food shortage in India, to the point where Pakistan and India were, and a number of other Asian countries were on the verge of starvation. And then came a scientist, a biologist from here, from the States, called Norman Borlaug. He had initially figured out how to breed a seed variety in Mexico that was resistant to this disease called wheat rust. And he applied the same uh, breeding technologies to South Asia, to rice, and that launched the Green Revolution. And but for that, India and Pakistan wouldn't be as, as sufficient as they are with, with food production, particularly parts like Punjab. The point being that neither of these problems really affected the developed world nearly as much in those days as it did the developing world. And right now, there is not, a, not enough money going into solving problems of this magnitude. Look, look at the development indicators around diarrheal disease, malaria, TB, and so on and so forth. Now, many of these problems are not very well understood. And the, the approaches are just, uh, just, let's just give, essentially, Western NGOs more aid money to try and solve these problems using the same old mechanism. And that's the genesis of uh, so th that. Uh, I was wrestling with this problem back, back when I was being, uh, working as a consultant to the, the UN um, and to a number of foundations and so on. And sort of a really interesting opportunity landed on my lap. And that has to do with this place called the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is two minutes up the hill here. The, this is one of the oldest national labs in the US, uh, created in 1931. Uh, since then, it has won 13 Nobel Prizes, which is the most of any non-academic institution in the world, I believe. Uh, it has historically been US-focused. So for a little while, it worked on weapons, but for the most part, it has focused on public goods. And the question on the table a couple of years back was, can this R&D be leveraged? When I say leveraged, what I mean is, there's all this IP sitting. Some of it is used to commercialize, some of it is not. But with a tweak, can this R&D, can this technology be used to solve the big problems in the developing world? And that led to the, the creation of our institute, which is called LIGHT, L-I-G-T-T. Uh, it is not spelled L-I-G-H-T, and I've learned that scientists don't make for good branding people. And our mission is to, is to use the R&D, not just in the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, but across the U.S. national lab system, which is many billions of dollars, 17 labs, across the University of California system, and then, then a number of other research institutes around the country and the world, to look for, to, to cherry pick, the, the types of R&D that can move the needle on these big problems. And what that led to, uh, as soon as we started, was a study that just got released a couple of weeks back. In fact, I believe it will be on NPR this coming week. And that is a study to identify the, the 50 most important science and technology breakthroughs required to solve global poverty and related problems. What are those problems? The general areas are health, food security, and agricultural development, gender equity, human rights, education, digital inclusion, water, electricity. 
and then resilience against climate change and environmental damage. Obviously a very broad set of areas. Uh, it took us two years to complete the study. It is available in all its 647 pages of glory uh, online. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're signed up uh, on this mailing list, I'll be delighted to work with Amjad to have you um, receive that study. Now, let's focus in on the education part of it and see what we found. Right? Now, before we go into that, it's uh, very important to understand the, uh, talk about, the, about the, method, the methodology a little bit. Now, some of it was interviews. We actually interviewed a lot of, uh, of the intended beneficiaries on the ground. Uh, we worked with 500 plus ex topic specific experts around the world. Um, you know, did our own uh, deep analytics as well as back of the envelope. In, 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 in some cases, there simply wasn't enough data available to, to make perfect guesses. So we said, Look, this is the best guess we can make. Uh, let's prove it wrong over time. And then, um, in addition to that, we asked a second set of questions, which is rec recognizing that, as I mentioned earlier, technology won't solve all these problems. In fact, often technology is not necessary. And when it is necessary, it's not sufficient. So to, for, for each of these problems, we, we, we said, what is the dependency on policy reforms, on training and human capital, on change in the business model of service delivery? on infrastructure development? Is it just a matter of access to finance? And then, is there a technology breakthrough? And I emphasize the phrase breakthrough because it means a technology that doesn't exist today, that requires fundamental work. Sometimes, and, and some of these things can be 20 years out, some of these can be three years out. They just don't exist today. And part of what we did was actually map it out on a timeline. What's the best case? Does it look, it, does it look like it's gonna happen soon or will it take 20 years? And our mission at our institute is to to take the, the challenges and the breakthroughs that are 5, 10, 15 years out and accelerate the time to market. And then once, as we do that, also then recognize once the technology is available, what is the dependency on these various things? Because you could build the perfect technology and if it is dependent on a policy reform but the policymakers don't, uh, uh, don't do their part, it will just sit on a shelf. So let's look at education now. And before talking about education, technology, I, I believe it's really important to unpack the whole host of issues that are involved in that. So I'll just throw a bunch of statistics at you. Going back to the, the, uh, the framework we used this morning around the Human Development Index and the deciles. So again, the, uh, to repeat, the, the horizontal axis is the, the Human Development Index created by the UN uh, DP. And the 10th the decile is the worst off, the first decile is the best off. The interesting thing is that for a while now, Certainly, since the Millennium Development Goals were launched in, in the year 2000, compulsory primary education is actually in, on the books in a number of countries across the board. So there are lots of very poor countries in which, in principle, students should go to school. That has not always been the case, as you can guess, but a remarkable thing happened since the, since the turn of the century, which is that MDG2, Millennium Development, Goal two actually incentivizes a lot of countries to increase primary school enrollment. So what you see is that around the turn of the century, only half the kids in the bottom decile countries, and then somewhat more, three quarters, in in uh, in deciles seven through nine, were actually enrolled. And over time, it's reached the numbers are much much healthier now. Of course, there's a whole lot behind this. Even as of a couple of years back, there was something like 60 million kids out of school at the primary school age. And uh, a small number of countries account for a good chunk of this. South Asia, India and Pakistan proudly leading the charge. Uh, also countries like Nigeria, which, are, which have large populations and great concentrations of poverty. Now, the question is, how do you solve this problem? And there is, you know, you will see in a second that enrollment is hard. It's only the beginning of the, the solution. The first big problem that we have to overcome is this, public expenditure. As I mentioned again this morning, in the 10th decile, it's $171 per child per year, and a good chunk of that goes into the ministry, well before it reaches any school or any child. Yeah. So there is very little data on how much that is, but my guess back at the envelope was about uh, 25 to 25% to a third actually reaches down, um, and that too is concentrated in, 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 in urban areas. Pakistan is in the 9th decile. Uh, and it is the, uh, across the decile, it's about $250 per child per year. 
Now, it is not simply a matter of increasing this. You can't just say, let's double this, because remember that a lot of the economies in these countries operate on an informal basis. There is no tax revenue. There is very little enforcement of tax collection. So, so it's not easy to just go to a government agency and say double or triple or quadruple the budget because the money is there. If money is not there, even if it's there, it finds its way to all sorts of interesting places. But if you believe that the top two deciles are actually doing a good job of education, that is a dramatic increase. How on earth can we get to $4,500, $8,000? $300 per child per year. It is, it is not possible. And so um, the challenge is now, without begging for more money from wealthy donor countries or from other donors, how do we solve this problem? Now let's look at the out-of-school problem, uh, unpack it a little bit. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a suggestion that uh, child labor is a, is a big part of it, and, and indeed it is. Uh, child labor best avoided, but as we all know, sometimes it is necessary. So part of the problem is child labor. Right? Um, beyond, and this is a question of access. Beyond access is this huge question of quality. And so now let's unpack what that means. And again, education experts, among whom I do not count myself, will, will point to a number of factors, one of which is student-to-teacher ratio. In the ninth decile, it's 41 student, uh, te uh, students per teacher in the, at the primary level, and in the bottom decile, it goes higher. Now, again, this statistic warrants unpacking, specifically in the following manner. Now, every, pretty much every government has a minimum level of training for its teachers for, for every level of education, and, and the, it's called the ISCED, which is the International Standard uh, something for Education. And um, level two is primary and so on and so forth. Level three is uh, lower secondary. Level five is, is college. Now, as you can see in, the, in the, the lower deciles, the requirement is not very stringent. And not only that, only a fraction of the teachers actually make that very low grade. And so if you take that student-teacher ratio, you sort of have to normalize it for the quality of the teachers. And if you just, again, make it back at the envelope math, Essentially, what that does is if you take out the teachers who don't meet that minimum standard, now you get to 48 students per teacher, which is not a healthy number. And, uh, now, what does that lead to? Number one, kids don't go. It's one thing to enroll because enrolling is just getting a name on a register. But getting the kids to go regularly, especially when distances are great, when they have to work, that is a monumental challenge. And as we can see, the absentee rates in, in the, uh, the lower DSL countries is very high. So you combine absentee rates, you combine uh, untrained teachers, you, you combine lack of accountability, and add all of that. Beyond the out-of-school problem, there's a much, much, much bigger problem. So let's say that, you know, there, by, by UNESCO estimates, there are 65 to 67 million, that is the word, students out of school, but there's a much larger problem looming above that. And that is that two to 300 million kids are getting education that's probably not worth it. And, um, and as a result, and, and uh, part particularly as a result of the failure of the public system, a lot of kids go to private schools. And what do these private schools look like? These statistics apply to private schools as well as public schools. Few of them have toilets, electricity, portable water, and this is a private school in, in, um, uh, in Liberia. This is a private school in Pakistan. And this is what the inside looks like, again, uh, no news to you. Um, the thing to remember is that the parents who send their kids here are extraordinarily proud because they didn't have even this. And so nothing to scoff at. We just have to recognize that this is the starting point. And because this is the starting point, and as you, you know, education ultimately and the value of education depends on so many other things, including the absorptive capacity of the economy to, to employ people. And that's where you start seeing this problem, which is the drop-off. So if primary education wasn't bad enough, the problem gets worse in secondary education, where the, the um, drop-off between enrollment rates is massive, especially as you get to the lower ends of the, um, the HDI spectrum. And how big is this problem? Again, no one's actually done the, the math on this. Uh, we just took a crack at it. So 
This is the population of youth aged uh, 15 to 19 um, in the world, and the developing world, which is, you say to ourselves, 7 through 10, that's 270 million kids. Right? Now, what are these kids doing? Again, take, this, take the following with a grain of salt because we just had to piece this together. It's not anywhere. Uh, it, it is not formally anywhere. So of those, 65 million, we believe, using that methodology I mentioned earlier, are, are enrolled in, a, in programs that are of decent quality, acceptable quality. Then 35 million, unacceptable quality. And then it just keeps getting worse. So there's this emergence of uh, uh, the, the, the different kind of schooling called TVET, Technical and Vocational Education Training. It's small, but emerging, so a small number of kids there. Um, then you have 165 million kids who are not really part of the secondary system, of which 100 million are literate, but not enrolled in secondary school, and 65 million kids are simply not literate. They just don't even have the basics to go to secondary school. The problem gets much worse in tertiary, again because of this problem, which is of the absorptive capacity of the, um, of the economy. Um, point being that even if you have an education, it is not clear you'll get a job. And that's partly because of the economy, also because of the relevance of the education. And in, in South Asia, it's particularly true where you can, you can read all the Shakespeare you want, but it won't get you into, school, into a, a job market. Um, now, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Is it primary, is it secondary, tertiary, access, quality? These are all very, very different problems with very different interventions, very different solutions, certainly from a technology point of view. My sense is that the technology currently exists to solve the primary problem because of, of the, the dropping prices of smartphones and the availability of content. It's not there yet, but it's, it's going to be there pretty soon. My sense, again, not being an education expert, is that really it's at the secondary level that where the intervention can have the biggest value. And the reason is the following. Add to what we talked about earlier this morning, uh, that the value of these, these touch-based uh, devices, smartphones and tablets, where you can have this tremendously interactive, customized, <coughs> sort of mass customization educational experience with feedback. Now, add to that also the fact that much of the Anglophone developing world, their secondary curricula are generally in line with the British A-level or level. Which means, again, that you can write a book. Uh, the third factor is that these markets tend to not be dominated, the, the textbook markets tend to not be dominated by large publishing houses. So the barriers to entry are very, very low. You can, with clever marketing, obviously you need to, that, that's, that's uh, a difficult problem. But with clever marketing, you can actually have a textbook that, that you can get pretty good adoption if you're consistent with the, with the, um, with the curriculum. And, um, uh, because the Anglophone developing world is a very large market between India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, and so on and so forth, uh, Kenya, it, it, the, the economics can actually work out pretty well too. And at the same time, there's no reason to necessarily aim this thing at the bottom of the pyramid. You can say, look, let's start with the, with the lower middle class and the upper lower class. Let's get some traction there and figure out a business model so that at some point it, it can trickle down. Um, and in a way, <coughs> Um, so a technology like this can address both the access and the, and the quality problem. And here's what I mean by the access and quality problem. Right? Um, the story I mentioned uh, this morning, which is the, the, the teachers actually try to get extra money by getting kids to come take tuition outside of class. And so the way that manifests itself in these, these entrance exams for college is that in India, we have uh, you know, the IITs and the regional engineering colleges and the medical schools, they have very, very competitive exams. And you have these very competent um, mail-in uh, and, and now online uh, companies that offer very good lessons, which only the middle class can afford. Right? And essentially what they do is they make you work through the physics problems and the math problems and the chemistry problems so that you have your exercise enough so that when, when, when you get to these exams, you're better prepared. Uh, and if you have an older sibling or if, if you have a parent who is schooled in this stuff, you can turn to them for help. But what if you don't? What if you're a, a lower income kid and your parents may, not, may or may not be educated? You may or may not have a sibling who can help you with this. What do you do then? That's where the drop-off starts. 
And that's the technology problem we have to solve. Tablets are getting cheap, but this is the hard problem. So how do you solve a physics problem online with dynamic learning? So multiple choice is easy. Right? You can answer A, B, C, and if you're, if you're getting it consistently wrong, then the, you can imagine an adaptive learning mechanism where it slows down the pace of learning and gives you remedial material. But actually interpreting the derivation of an equation. And remember that derivation is very important. I have not seen the cognitive science behind this, but I'm absolutely willing to bet that the mechanisms to choose between multiple choice answers is very different from the mechanism used to derive a physics equation or solve a chemistry um, uh, reaction. So figuring out how to take handwriting on one of these devices, interpreting that, figuring out what's, you know, uh, what these various symbols mean, and then converting that into feedback is a level of artificial intelligence that is complicated. I don't know anyone who's actually working on it. I think it's hard to solve. Um, you know, and my doctorate is actually in artificial intelligence, so it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that's particularly exciting to me. But no one's working on it here because it's not needed but it is needed in the kind of context we're talking about. So that, I believe, is the single most important technology breakthrough to solve this problem. It is a smart electronic textbook that allows people to learn in the absence of extra tuition, in the absence of a support mechanism like a family member, science, technology, math. Um, we are guessing that uh, the world will get there in four or five years. We are taking on that problem. Haven't started doing anything on it except make nice PowerPoint slides. But hopefully we'll start working on it soon. And if you have any interest in it, please let us know. Thank you.